Okay, so I'm pleased to introduce Patrick Sowers, which is the King County Noxious Weed Control Program. Um, Patrick is an expert in GIS and databases and has a really excellent system that I think will uh, be really helpful for a lot of people in this room who quickly um, works with private landowners um, on invasive species control. Perfect, Patrick. So this is going to be really helpful for everyone. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I don't know how much of an expert I am at JS. Um, I don't really have any whole lot of formal training. Um, I've mostly learned a lot of what I know on the job. Um, for, for those of you outside of the county or outside of uh, Washington State, King County um, is in central Puget Sound. It's where Seattle is. I'll just give you a reference. So today I'm going to talk about, um, I was asked to, to, to talk about how best to manage um, landowners and specifically landowner permissions. Um, it's a little bit of a dry topic. I don't have any great photos of crabs or mussels or anything like that. So, uh, you know, feel free to go grab some coffee if I get into some really technical details that are boring for some of you. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to start out giving an overview of our, what, of our, what our Noxious Weed Control Program does um, and then talk about how we manage our data and then uh, end with a demo of um, how you might um, create your own data management system for landowners if you're a small organization and you're looking at maybe upgrading from, you know, an Excel spreadsheet to a GIS database. I'm going to kind of talk about some tips, um, some concepts to think about if you're, if you're thinking about making that move. Um, so to begin with, uh, our program's focus is to, uh, uh, or, or goal is to prevent the spread of uh, invasive plants throughout the county. Um, we're essentially uh, enforcing the state noxious weed law, um, which um, pretty much says that if there's a, a list of plants that are I have such a big, big impact that um, if, if the plants are on a, a landowner's property, they're responsible for controlling it and preventing it from spreading beyond their property. Um, we're working with uh, private owners, public landowners throughout the county. Um, we do a lot of outreach and education. Um, a lot of you know uh, why we're um, trying to uh, remove noxious weeds. Uh, we're mostly just focused on weeds that have uh, large impacts. A lot of you know the, the major um, impacts of noxious weeds, but we have a... Okay. Um, and I already just talked about that, that um, in King County, the, 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 for regulated noxious weeds, the landowner is responsible for controlling noxious weeds, but in a lot of cases where the weeds are really difficult to remove, or they're in sensitive habitats, we're uh, assisting. Um, and I'll cover some of those weeds where we're doing a lot of in-house control work. And in those cases, that's where we need permission. Um, just to, I'm gonna highlight a couple of uh, the high priority weeds that we're focused on. Some of these you might be familiar with already. Um, one is giant hogweed. This one can cause uh, severe burns um, if you make contact with it and get the sap on you. Um, another one that's more of a, a pasture weed and it's toxic to livestock is uh, tansy ragwort. Um, this one isn't a huge priority um, in a lot of our urban areas in King County. Um, its main impacts are in, are in rural areas where we still have um, pastures. Um, another one is police helmet. This is creates monocultures in uh, wetlands and riparian areas. Shiny geranium is, uh, we're finding a lot more of it in the county, coming up from mostly Oregon on uh, plant stock. Um, it creates monocultures and understories as well. Um, one plant where we're doing a lot of in-house control on because it's such a high priority is garlic mustard. Um, this creates really dense monocultures and, and forested understories. Um, Sayward earlier had um, given a good overview of, of uh, our work on knotweed with throughout the county and this one we're pretty much exclusively doing in-house control um, there's there's a little bit of uh, landowners that are ambitious and doing their own control but for the most part we're doing the bulk of the control ourselves um, say we gave a uh, overview of where we're working on, on river systems uh, here's another look at it um, so we're really working with uh, thousands of landowners um, and just uh, tons, tons of sites uh, here's a, 
Another uh, visual of uh, more of our upland weeds that we're working on throughout the county. Um, so we just have a lot of sites that we're working on, a lot of data. Um, but luckily we have a pretty big team that's um, somewhat well funded compared to a lot of the smaller counties that are out there. Um, we have, we divide our county up into eight regions. So we have regional specialists that oversee that region. Um, I'm a regional specialist for kind of the center of the county. We also have a team that's focused mostly on riparian weeds. Uh, that's uh, Sayward's work. Um, those are working on mostly knotweed um, on major river systems. Um, so yeah, I just mentioned that I'm a regional specialist, um, but over the last couple of years, I've taken more of a data management role um, because we're constantly coming up with uh, new, more complex systems to manage and develop. Um, so quick overview of what kind of data we're collecting. Um, or we've got a lot of staff out in the field. Um, it, it gets up in probably about uh, 20, upper 20s of, of temporary staff that are doing uh, field data collection throughout the season. Um, we work with a lot of property owners, a lot of sites, and um, information that we're recording are um, property owner details like contact information um, and site information and infestations that are on those sites and we're recording a, a yearly survey um, for weeds on the site of how much area we've found and whether whether or not it was controlled and how it was controlled and what i'm going to talk about today um, is we're also tracking um, which sites we have permission to do control work on. Uh, so pre prior to 2015, uh, we were doing most of our data collection out in the field on paper. Um, and it was pretty uh, tedious to come back to the office and we had an access database that we were transcribing this into. So a lot of uh, duplicating of uh, data entry and also resulted in errors. And since then we've moved to a system of of WebGIS, which we're using um, kind of the Esri suite of products, uh, ArcMap, and which is their desktop application, and ArcGIS Collector, which is the field data collection component. Um, we also have a backend SQL Server database, which is where we're pushing our field collected data. It's kind of a complex system. Um, we have the luxury at King County of having a uh, pretty large IT uh, program that we can work with um, and a couple years ago they built us a custom web app to interact with our SQL server database so that's one way that we're interacting with our kind of tabular data um, I mentioned before we have ArcGIS server which is where our spatial data our field collected da data is stored and then nightly we have some Python scripts that are moving the data back and forth so it's kind of complex it works really well for us um, it might not be that feasible to come up with something like this for a smaller organization, but I'm gonna kind of um, show you how you might start developing your own GIS that's not as complicated as something like this. Um, so specifically, what kind of property owner data we're collecting? Uh, most importantly is the contact owner details. Um, we have a, a running list of notes for a site, which we call our narratives. So we can have a site history that we're logging. Um, and then we have tracking whether or not we've sent them uh, email letters and um, what I'm going to get into is uh, we're also tracking uh, waivers for permissions. Um, so here's an example of, of I know text is really kind of small but uh, one of whatever one of our landowner permission uh, letters that we send out looks like um, and we're just trying to limit get permission and limit our liability um, for doing work on the property. The, the lower section of the waiver um, we usually have options for how many years of permission we, we can get. Uh, and we're trying to get people to, especially in the case of knotweed, where it takes a long time to control, we're trying to get people to give us permission for at least 10 years. Um, that way we don't have to uh, go back to the same owner multiple times and get permission. So, um, and we've had pretty good uh, responses from landowners in, in giving us permission. Um, you know, there are some holdouts, but for the most part, um, we've got pretty good response. Um, I know in some cases where we do get pushback for certain weeds, um, usually when we tell the landowner that, you know, if we're not gonna do it, then you're technically responsible for controlling the weeds, 
then they usually um, kind of uh, will, will give us permission after that. Um, so after we've ent entered our wave our data into our database, um, including uh, the, the end date of, of our permission, um, we can view it um, spatially, either an arc map or in a web map, and it kind of looks like this. Um, we are tracking our permission, we are uh, symbolizing our, our, our waivers um, by whether or not we have, uh, whether or not we've uh, sent a letter um, but haven't got any response back, whether, whether or not we have permission. Um, we also have the option for, for them to have restrictions where we need to call, call them uh, before we visit their site and whether or not uh, there's a couple holdouts that give us uh, strictly no permission. Um, so I'm gonna get into a, a little bit of a demo for uh, how this is possible without having, you know, like a, a developer build you a SQL Server database. Um, there's been a lot of improvements in ArcGIS Online in the last couple of years. So if you do have ArcMap licenses, it is possible to start managing owners uh, and and uh, properties in ArcGIS Online. There's been some advances that allow that to happen efficiently in the last couple of years. Um, you're gonna need parcel data. Um, you can generally get that from county websites. Some counties don't, uh, it's harder to find parcel data, um, but sometimes cities have that as well. Um, so I'm gonna get into some concepts to think about uh, just if you're moving from traditional Excel spreadsheet to uh, more of a relational database and why you wanna do that. Um, and the major reason is to just reduce redundancy and errors in your data. Um, so in a traditional Excel spreadsheet, if you're uh, tracking your sites, parcels, and who owns them, you're gonna be duplicating a lot of data and um, moving to a relational database, um, you're gonna separate that site and uh, owner into two separate tables um, and you only you're only going to have one uh, record of that owner and you're going to relate it um, using the ID to the site so in that, in that way if, if if you need to update the owner details you're only doing it once rather than um, five times in the other example um, how that's managed in art map is uh, setting up what they call relationship classes. Sorry if this is a little bit technical, but um, it's, if you're gonna set this up, it's kind of what you need to, to use to, to uh, set up these relationships between the sites and owners. Um, and what that looks like in ArcMap, you're gonna wanna use a file geodatabase. Um, some of you might be more familiar with uh, shapefiles. Um, those don't support um, relationship properties. Uh, and in a file geo database, you can have relationship properties. So, so in this example, I, it's pretty simple. I have owners, uh, owner table, parcel layer, and a waiver table, and then two relationship classes that kind of define how those are related. Um, and there's, there's tutorials out there if you wanna get into um, setting those up, but it's, but it's not that complicated. Um, so the second step um, to get this into ArcGIS Online to be used on mobile devices is to publish it into ArcGIS Online and I'm gonna give a demo if I can. All right. So in, the, in the, this example, I just grabbed the first 10 parcels in the county just to keep the data set small to give an example. Um, this is what it looks like in ArcGIS Online once we've published that uh, geo database that I just showed you. Um, another couple things to look at that are on here are owners. Owner table is on here and waivers are on here. Um, and we'll take a, a little quick look at some owners that I've added already. I've added some uh, dummy records in here. 
And you can see that these owners have a unique ID for each owner. And that is what we use to tie to a parcel like I was showing in. So this owner ID is related to this ID that's in the table. So that's gonna how, how you connect one owner with multiple sites you're going to, for each site that they own, uh, maintain that ID. And if you need to update the owner, that's where you're gonna replace that, that ID. Um, now, one important thing that um, I'm gonna get into is how to symbolize that data, hold on, how much time do, do I have? Okay. So we're gonna to wanna to symbolize these parcels by which ones have waivers. And in the last couple of years, ArcGIS Online implemented a new feature to where you can join the parcel layer to one of the tables. Um, and how you do that is you use this analysis tab, go to summarize data, join features, and you choose which two layers you want to join. And that's gonna be able to bring the most recent waiver data to that parcel. So I've already done that. And what that looks like is this layer. So I've already entered some dummy data in here to where um, the green are sites that have waivers and the red parcels where it's expired. And you can also do a similar join to see who is, who owns these parcels um, by joining the parcel layer and the owner table. Um, So once we've done that join, we've brought over the, the owner information that are that would otherwise be um, in separate separate tables. So um, there's a lot more functionality that you can add to this. Um, in our database, we're uh, associating infestations to each each property. Um, I'm not going to get into what that really looks like. It's um, uh, it would take a little while to explain how it all works, but this is kind of a really simple explanation of how how you could manage uh, your property owners efficiently in ArcGIS Online now if you're looking at going from a um, traditional Excel spreadsheet to a GIS database. And that's a little bit early on time, but I don't know if anyone has specific questions I can talk to. Sure, yeah, there, there definitely is a learning curve uh, for our field staff for doing for using Collector. Um, luckily for our uh, web interface that our, one of our de developers built for us, it's pretty user friendly as far as uh, being able to access all the tables you need to, a little bit more user friendly than using something like ArcMap. But we do have uh, full day training days, usually at the beginning of the season for our seasonals to, to, to learn how to enter data on Collector and have a lot of documentation that they can refer to um, later on. So, um, and we try to set up the data to where it's pretty simple. Um, it's a lot of our uh, users who are seasonals aren't doing uh, landowner management. Um, that's kind of something 
uh, more of our full-time uh, employees are doing, whereas our seasonals are recording information like how much weed area was there for a certain species and whether or not the plant got controlled or not. So they're more focused on a, a, a easier uh, data set to manage than, than something more complex like owner, owner management, which can kind of get complicated. Yeah, I guess two things. So to tack onto that, um, I'm setting something like this up for Nooksack Salmon Enhancement up here. Uh, and we have interns and AmeriCorps staff annually that will run our GIS online. And part of our nonprofit suite with Esri um, is access to their online trainings. And there's a lot of resources as far as learning how to use Collector and uh, GIS online that was easy enough for me to set up just this list of trainings for them to go to and take and do on their own time. Um, but then my question for you is, have you guys started using this with the workforce app as well and tried that at all? Uh, we've looked into that and it's, um, I've tested it out and it just kind of feels a little bit clunky to me. And um, you're generally needing, for using the Esri workforce app, it's an app where you have um, kind of an operator who assigns work to field staff and since we're working with uh, you know, thousands of sites, it'd be a little bit onerous for somebody to have to as initially assign you know, work to another user. Um, so uh, that's not really uh, an application that we're using that much. We are uh, expanding our, our use of other uh, apps through, from Esri, one of them being uh, Quick Capture, which is a new one. Um, I don't have a demo of it, but it's, it's one that we're replacing our traditional Garmin units with. Um, it's, it's a little bit more of a dumbed down version of Collector. You can have preset uh, fields where, um, where you're just clicking the button once rather than having to enter in the data in multiple fields, you just click it once and it's um, recording that data. But that's, that's one that's, uh, that we're using more to replace GPS units. Have you, um, with regard to your permission forms, have you considered um, non-expiring, non-species specific forms? I don't, I don't know if we've tested that out as much. I, I guess I could throw that to our knotweed team. We do some non-species specific forms, but, or waivers, but they, they're kind of few and far between because you have to contact people for those things anyway. Um, a lot of times different weeds will be controlled at different times of year. So you, you don't want to freak people out by saying we, like I signed my life away so you can always come on my property to kill all the weeds. So that's the main reason we haven't done that. Thank you, Pat.